So business starts for me in 1995 when I founded Eco Electricity. We were the world's first green energy company. We made green electricity available for the first time. And then in the 2000s, I started a company called uh, the Electric Highway. And that was a national network of charging points in Britain for electric vehicles. And its purpose was to break the chicken and egg impasse where nobody was building infrastructure because there weren't enough cars on the road and people weren't buying electric cars because there was nowhere to charge up. So that was about 2010. Same year, I rescued our local football club called Forest Green Rovers. And uh, over the next few years, built them into what FIFA and the UN have described as the world's greenest football club. And Saturday to just gone, we got promoted to League One, which is like a really Yeah, congratulations. Deal. Wow, fantastic. We, we took the world's first trip of a football club to an away game in an electric coach on that day, which was quite cool. Brilliant. Um, more recently, I set up a company called Devil's Kitchen, which makes plant-based food uh, for schools. And okay. uh, it started out at schools and now it's in retail as well. Um, I founded Sky Diamond, which is a company that makes diamonds from atmospheric carbon. We literally turn thin air into diamonds. And uh, more recently, again, the Green Britain Academy, which is about training people for green jobs, people in the kind of uh, long-term unemployed sector of, of our country and um, then something called the Ministry of Eco Education which uh, through which we've created uh, an entire primary school curriculum that's eco themed in every topic we did it working with head teachers and eco experts and people like that and that's now being run by seven schools as a pilot this year we hope to ramp that up uh, for the coming year in September and that's more or less it. Wow, that's a lot of different things you're involved in. Um, so, I mean, I think with the, the next question I was going to ask is about how those, I suppose, relate to the ecological and climate emergency. But from what you're saying so far, I mean, those are almost centered. Aren't, it sounds to me, is that the case? That you, That's Our almost purpose. your starting point? Our purpose is sustainability. Before the climate crisis became a term in common use, uh, we started when I became aware of uh, climate change, as it was known back in the 90s. Um, and, and so our first target was energy, because I saw that it was the biggest single cause of carbon emissions in our economy in Britain. And so I set out to uh, change the way energy was made and used in Britain. And then in the early 2000s, I went looking for the second and third biggest source of carbon, because it made sense to had to be those. And we felt like we had tackled the first one and we were on the path. And we found that to be transport and food. And um, interestingly, energy, transport, and food between them are responsible for 80% of everybody's personal carbon footprints. And that translates pretty well to a business of any size and a football club. And so it became our central message. The theme of our work uh, to bring sustainability has been focused on energy, transport, and food. Okay. Diamond, diamonds are just an outlier. I don't know. <laughs> I know where they came from. It came from okay. trying to create a carbon capture and storage uh, mm -hmm. method and, and, and outcome. Uh, but it's turned into something else. Okay, okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. So just turning to this idea of leadership and you as a leader, I mean, you've talked about all these things, you've initiated the kind of um, organizations, the ideas that you've brought to being, um, you know, which is, is, is fascinating, incredible set of activities that you've been involved with and developed. So, but what does being a good leader mean to you? When you, when you think about you in those organizations and activities you've done? Well, I, think, um, <clears throat> I think you need to be clear about what it is you're trying to do and the way that you're gonna try and do it as well. Um, so for example, we have, a, we have an ethos here that we share with everybody that joins us. There's only one side of A4, but it talks about how we treat each other and how we treat our customers and our suppliers and basically everybody. And we treat everybody the same way. It's about having peer-to-peer -peer relationships and being open and honest and transparent in everything that we do. That's our core principle for working together as a team. I try to be clear and also consistent in my approach to everything. And uh, I guess for me, you know, being successful means we achieve our objectives and we have a happy team. We have a team of people that can um, enjoy what they do, that can progress uh, you know, through life and through careers. And, uh, and we have a happy team because, you know, there's nothing better than working in a cohesive, happy team, whether you meet your objectives or not. That's the best place to be. 
Okay, and the, and the kind of ethos that you have there, I mean, how would you describe your kind of this sort of, I don't know, some people talk about styles of leadership, maybe, I mean, is this, are you kind of, a, would you see yourself as a more sort of democratic leader or, um, I, 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 I don't know, how, how do you see yourself operating? I don't know, really, I just do what I feel is right, you know, I do things my own way, and um, maybe I could be described as a democratic autocrat. Uh, because okay. I like, I absolutely like to hear other people's views on things, but ultimately I'll end up making the decision and that's fine. You know, I think that's, that's how it has to be. And through that, we get great consistency. So all of these companies I've formed, have got no shareholders, which is fantastic. It means we don't have other people's interests to look out for. We can make decisions based on what we want as an outcome, which is always about the environment and social good. It's not about making money and we don't have to worry about shareholders in that respect. And that's a very important thing. Yeah, I know. I mean, obviously, reading the materials as, through the research and preparing for the interview, I mean, I know you talk a lot about the independence. I uh, think it's particularly about some of the, the ideas on ecotricity, but I guess maybe it relates to the organizations that you've also talked about. I mean, well, I, I, is that, sorry, yeah, let me just sorry. answer that. It, it is. It means that we can do the things we believe in without caring if they have a financial future. We don't have to write a business plan and convince ourselves or anybody else that there's money in it. We do it because we think it needs to be done. And then if later on it turns out there's money in it, that's great because that fuels us to do the next thing. Mm. So when you're, I suppose you kind of come into these rooms, maybe you do, maybe you try and avoid them, but of other kind of folks around um, greening energy or aspects of the, the say renewables or other parts of sustainability agendas, you would see as more kind of mainstream profit orientated i mean is that do you find that quite a difficult interaction do you see yourself as very different from what they're what they're offering yeah uh i don't necessarily find it difficult because i've not really found it difficult to be myself all my life and so i don't really care about what other people do um, <laughs> i just get on and do what i want to do okay that's great um and when you said about independence the organization the ethos the sort of focus around sustainability as you say now the sort of climate emergency as it's framed um what's been a do you find what's been most challenging about um prioritizing ecological sustainability let's say when you're in a in a business that is around profit or is it that this independence and you say that you don't necessarily have to think about shareholders is that does that really get rid of the tensions potential tensions for you i don't know because i've never been in a different situation i would say we don't have tensions is what i tried to say to you when we make decisions it's based on the outcome we're looking for environment and social it's not about making money ever we don't have to care about shareholders completely not just uh, you know in a sense as i think you as i think you said we just don't have that issue so i've never been in a conventional business uh, so i can't tell you that it, okay. it takes away the tensions i can just tell you that we don't have them okay so recruiting people in let's say with that ethos that are going to be a financial director or financial involved in the finance of the company i mean is that can that be difficult for some of those people that are trying to manage you know that they've got this job to make sure that you know the accounts work out and these things happen or is uh, or have you, you just not really felt that in the organizations that you've been part I've never of felt, <clears throat> i've never felt that difficulty i think uh i understand where the question comes from if we have this attitude to making money then you know do we look credible will people join us so you've got to bear in mind that we do make money we have to make money to survive we're not funded by somebody else yeah. but it, what we do is not we don't exist to make money. We exist for another purpose. And my favorite way to explain that is the old um, kind of adage come question. Do you live to eat or do you eat to live? We eat to live. So our purpose in making money is to do our job, get the outcome that we want. Most businesses today make money. That's their purpose. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the difference. There's a big difference. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, I guess that's why we really wanted to talk to you and hear, hear your kind of approaches, really, because it's um, often a viewpoint that is is marginalized, uh, but it's so, I think, important in thinking about business and what that means in the current era of uh, climate emergency. So well, I think I, I think capitalism, it's, capitalism itself has uh, to a degree been hijacked and become something that's bad for people and bad for the world. The pursuit of money above all else leads to bad decisions. And I think that kind of business got us to where we are completely in terms of our unsustainability. 
But actually, at the same time, business is the key to getting out of it most quickly. We need to repurpose business to have social and environment outcomes first before making money. And we can use business as a tool to create those outcomes that we desperately need. That's what I've been doing uh, for the last 25 years. Okay. Um, I think we'll pick up on some of those aspects a little bit, but I just before we go there, um, I was just wondering about, you know, looking back, were there, when you were trying to act in, you know, the organization you're part of with the priority around ecological sustainability, I mean, are there times where you'd say, you know, you, you made the wrong choices or you didn't, it didn't, you didn't do as well as you might have wanted to around the acting for sustainability, other things kind of got in, got in the way. No, I wouldn't. We have a no compromise position. We have a okay. one page environment uh, policy mm. on side of A4, and it makes it clear in any conflict between money and the environment, mm. it's the environment first always. Okay. Um, and I was re- I was looking at your book um, a few weeks ago, which is really great. Thanks, thanks for writing it, and it was really enjoyable to to read. And um, I mean, certainly thinking about, I remember one evening I was looking at the stuff around Thames Water. I, mean, I won't go into the details. People listening into this, but it was really about the ethics of doing business with other organisations. And I don't know, do those experience of en- experiences of engaging with other organisations that um, don't I suppose fit with your um, ethos. Let's say is that is that been important to kind of shaping who who you are and what you do at, in these in these roles as a leader? I guess you know you have to say probably it has been because it's uh, those, those were big experiences. Thames, Tesla, uh, TXU as well. I think they're the big three. They all begin mm. with a T, which is just <laughs> you know one of those things. Yeah. Um, you know they're a big part of my. Uh, my life in business, big part of our story at Eco Tristy. So you, you couldn't avoid the conclusion that they will have shaped uh, uh, through our experience, our worldview. Okay, okay. Um, so just thinking more sort of big picture here, I suppose, and, and thinking about, and you mentioned already ideas of capitalism and I suppose repurposing capitalism, repurposing business, I think is some of the language that you've used uh, looking at some of the reading. I mean, so so where do you see what what needs to happen there in terms of leadership around some of these economic systems and arrangements that we're part of? What what do you think needs to happen? We could we could do it slowly. We could hope that businesses evolve that way and that uh, people, customers, I hate the word consumers, choose those kinds of businesses over conventional ones, and so it becomes you know the the done way uh, or the way to do things and we can see that to a degree already you know business kind of queuing up to tick environment boxes with csr programs and esg more recently and and that kind of stuff you know i'm a little bit skeptical about a lot of that but you can see why it's happening and that's a good thing or we could change company law and we could have it written into company law that companies must do x y and z uh, rather than have a overriding obligation to make money for shareholders, which is the way it currently is. Okay. And I mean, part of that um, in terms of kind of, I suppose, social movement activities and thinking about things like Extinction Rebellion, um, I mean, what role do you think those have to, I mean, is that just in a fundamental tension with business, those kind of organ, those sort of social movements that are pushing for change? Or is there, is there a conversation to be had? Well, do you mean business generally or our business? Uh, business generally. I mean, sort of yeah. talking bigger picture here. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because I mean, we support XR. We've declared sure. a climate emergency and all this kind of stuff. We funded Just Stop Oil. Um, <clears throat> you know, we support the work that they do. I think for it depends on the business. You know, there's a spectrum right now. The bad guys and the less than bad, almost good guys in in everyday business. You know, there are people that are on the path that know they need to get somewhere, and there are people that. Well, definitely aren't or are spinning uh, what they're doing about it. For those people, then absolutely XR and Just Stop Oil are a problem um, and they are in conflict. Uh, for these people, uh, less so, I would say. So it's just a continuum of, of, of where the business is in terms of the environment and uh, okay. therefore how they sit with XR and people like that, in my opinion. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, some of my work, I mean, I've spoken to senior people in the energy market, you know, that work in a traditionally orientated profit driven organizations and you'll say to them um well and they'll talk about tensions um that you as you said in terms of financial and environment or environment sustainability um and 
and they sort of say, oh, well, I'm sort of powerless here. I'm kind of helpless. What, what, what do you say? What would you say to those? If you're in that conversation with somebody, what, what do you say to these senior people? And these are the most senior people in some of these organizations. And they won't say this publicly, but certainly privately. What would you say to them? Well, I don't know, really. If they're powerless because they feel the obligation to stock markets and shareholders, then I mean, it bears out what I was just saying to you previously, that perhaps we need to change company law so that there are different priorities for companies. And that would give the power back to them in this case to do something more on the environment. Right. You know, maybe they're just saying that as an excuse. I don't know. I'm not in the conversation. Sure. But big companies need to change what they do. Energy companies, oil and gas companies, they have to see that the writing is on the wall. I think they do. Uh, but at the moment, they talk about a transition and the next three or four decades to get to zero carbon, all that kind of stuff. They have to stop that. It's BS. We don't have 30, 40 years. We have to get on with it now. And they should rapidly change what they do. But they're not helped in this by the government that is pouring money into fossil fuel exploration and fossil fuel subsidies for production uh, and tax breaks for flying and all this kind of stuff. They're not helped by that because they make it more economic to continue on the the uh, old way of doing things rather than switch now to the to the new way. They make it harder for companies to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank but you. But by unbalancing our economy is what they do. Yeah. When talking about kind of thinking about company law and those those sorts of changes, I and mean, what what scale of change are you are you seeing that we're what what are we looking at here if we're really serious about this climate emergency? Well, we have to um, get off fossil fuels. I would say by twenty thirty, and at least be eighty or ninety percent off of fossil fuels by that date. We're absolutely capable of doing that with electricity. Gas is slightly more of a challenge, but not as big as everybody thinks that it is because we can make gas here from grass. We've got enough grass to make enough to power the whole country. And there's a report coming out next week that we've commissioned from Imperial College to, uh, to show that. At the same time, we've got to electrify transport as fast as we can because that's a big consumer of fossil fuels and therefore driver of pollution and climate change. Electric cars uh, are happening. There won't be any new electric cars available to buy, I don't think, after 2030. That's a good thing. Uh, buses are on the road. FGR took a drive in one the other day, uh, Saturday just gone. Uh, HGVs are coming. And within 10 years, electric planes will be in the sky. So the transport sector is on the move. The, the energy sector is doable. We have the technology. It's cost effective. You know, the economics are on our side. So we can do that first and fastest while transport happens. And food is a really simple one. We just got to change what we eat. And again, coming back to the point about the energy company and the, and the playing field, the government makes it an uneven playing field by subsidizing animal products, making them cheaper than they really should be. And it has a disastrous impact on the world when we when we look at the Western diet. So, but that's an easy change. We don't need technology. We don't even need money. We just need to stop putting money into the bad way of doing things. So picking up on the transport thing, and that's really fascinating about the electric bus with Forest Green. Um, what are we, so in terms of this sort of current, the relationship here around you know, technology development, governments and business, I mean, what, what do you think has got to change there if we are to you know, pursue greener zero carbon technology the government <laughs> okay. but simply we need a government that gets it we need politicians that actually get it so that we have policies that take us there right now we've got politicians that are ticking a box they're saying the right things and doing things completely differently you know you've got boris johnson and the current government talking about zero carbon making pledges left right and center and then going out and chucking another couple of billion into north sea exploration allowing a coal mine to open up in, in Wales um, and, you know, spending 20 billion on a road program, a third runway at Heathrow, all kinds of bad stuff that's that's pulling completely in the wrong direction. Uh, and at the same time, maintaining the ban on onshore wind, our cheapest, fastest form of energy that we can build. So uh, we need politicians to get it. It's not, not more complicated than that. Uh, because we have the technology, the economics are on our side, and the people are increasingly on our side. All the surveys show that they want to see more done on this front. And actually, the benefits of a green economy are enormous. And we've just got to, a bit like how you began this interview talking to me, we've got to show that there are economic uh, benefits intrinsic with the environmental ones. It's not about paying for something that's good for the environment. It's about making a change that's good in all respects. It's not actually a cost. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Um, and, and staying on the politics side, I know I was picking up some news. I don't know, maybe this isn't quite up to date, but there was a suggestion that you were looking at, you know, looking at leadership in the direction of the political sphere. I mean, what's what are you? What's your plan there, and what are, what are you thinking about? My plan, such that I have one, is to uh, make the time to be able to be involved in the next general election. <clears throat> I haven't decided how best to do that, but I think it's the most important election of my lifetime, of all of our lifetimes, when effectively we've got half of that vital decade that the UN told us we had five years ago, or will be by then, left in which to take action. And it's vital we have a government that you know, gets on with it. So um, I've put Ecotricity up for sale to free myself in terms of time and also in terms of, um, what would you call it, conflict of interest, apparent conflict of interest as the boss of a green energy company arguing for the things I will argue for during the election would just be, you know, wide open to claims of conflict of interest. So I'm going to um, pass the baton on uh, to somebody else for Ecotricity and um, move in a new direction. Because I think it's the last piece of the puzzle. We have everything else. I mentioned it before, technology, economics, uh, popular support. We just don't have politicians that get it. Okay. Um, and just thinking back on the company that you're saying, I mean, what, because <clears throat> I guess you've, obviously, you're, you've been at the center of ecotricity for over these decades and the various associated organizations. I mean, what's your hope for ecotricity in terms of its, um, the ethos that you've set out and what, how does that relate to its sale? What, how are you going to, uh, what's your hopes for what's going to happen next? Well, I have to find the right buyer, don't I? Somebody that has the commitment, somebody that has the commitment to green energy that I have and that we have mm -hmm. uh, and has the deeper pockets that we don't have as well, which is quite important because we've got a pipeline of 2000 megawatts of green energy projects that need to be built. It needs an investment of somewhere between two and three billion pounds. And we could try to grow organically as we have for the last quarter century. We've got to about 100 megawatts of our own generation. And there was a point early in the 2000s when one in every 10 windmills in Britain was from us, which was quite big. But that's been diluted since then. Um, and what Ecotricity really needs, I think, is somebody with plenty of money, as well as the conviction, to take it forward and, and do more with it. So it's an opportunity for Ecotricity as well at the same time. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Dale, was there anything else you wanted to say before we kind of close off this, this interview? I would just say this, uh, how we run businesses is a choice. We aren't forced to run them in any particular way. We don't have to hide behind the excuse uh, that we need to make money because we're a business and that's why we make these decisions. And, and, and you know, we shouldn't do that. We don't do that. And, and nobody has to do that. You can't use business as an excuse for bad decisions, decisions that are bad for the environment or bad for people. I think that's wrong. That's great. Thanks very much, Dale. I really appreciate your time today. Um, and it's really, it is really good to speak with you. And uh, all the best with your plans as they emerge, as these things always do. And um, yeah, hope to hear more from you. Mm -hmm.